So over the past seven to 10 years, uh, a bunch of techies, primarily based out of Bangalore, um, have been working on solving for a person like Rajni. Um, Rajni is an informal street vendor. Uh, she goes to the money lender in the morning uh, to take an intraday loan. Uh, more often than not, extremely high interest rates of about 1% to 2% per day, which works out to about 1,000% per, uh, per annum. And the weird part is people like Rajni, uh, while they have the highest repayment rates, uh, also suffer uh, with the highest interest rates. And so as we thought about this problem, um, and Rajni is not alone, so uh, there are tens of millions of businesses in India. Uh, we are largely a credit-starved nation. Um, in our GST system alone, you've got 10, million 10 or 11 million businesses registered. Um, 8 million of them pay tax uh, regularly, but only 1.2 million of them have ever had any access to formal credit. So there are about 6.8 million small businesses in India uh, that still access credit from the informal system. And so if we can formalize that, um, and they are able to even recruit one more person into their team, uh, that generates approximately 6.8 million jobs right away. And that does not um, lie only with SMEs or MSMEs, but it applies also to the individual retail sector where uh, about a billion Indians don't have a credit score. And so as we thought about this problem, um, there were really two approaches. One is we could say, uh, let things be and over the next, like a Darwinian theory, over the next few hundred years, things would kind of sort themselves out. Or how do we kind of accelerate that? Um, and then there was a very peculiar moment in uh, human history um, known as the Cambrian explosion, uh, where apparently most of, during at that point in time, most of animal phyla was created and a lot of the complex wildlife that we see around us. And drawing inspiration from the Cambrian explosion, we were like, how do we kind of create a Cambrian explosion of financial products in India? And that led us to a new style of thinking about this uh, from the perspective of a playground. Uh, so we asked ourselves, can we create a digital playground uh, where new types of financial products can be created? So we write the right set of rules like interoperability, bring in the right set of players, and deliver the right set of financial goods. And that led us to work on something known as the India stack. Um, it started off first with Aadhaar. Um, so Aadhaar was meant to give um, a billion Indians a digital identity, and today on the Aadhaar platform, there are about 1.2 billion Indians registered. Um, it's the world's largest biometric ID project, um, and every single day, about 40 to 50 million Indians authenticate themselves. The way it works is the Aadhaar is a simple 12-digit number, uh, um, and against that, it contains minimal bi demographic information and your biometrics that allows you to establish uniqueness and prove your identity in a low-cost manner. Um, the lack of an identity was one of the major problems which denied people, especially in the informal sector, from accessing services because it was very expensive to serve them. Um, along the, and, and the way we designed Aadhaar was essentially creating it using an open API framework. Um, API stands for Application Programming Interface. Essentially, it's a complex jargon word for saying that it allows two systems to talk to each other. So in the old, old world of building technology, uh, the typical approach taken by the government was, let's build a portal, which is one single solution, and let's expect all Indians to come and log onto that portal and access services. Uh, but given our scale, a population scale of a billion plus, plus the extreme diversity that we have, different states, different languages, different cultures, we were like, we need a different approach. So why can't we create Aadhaar as a digital ID platform that allows businesses to then customize it subsequently, kind of like Lego blocks. And that's why today you can authenticate against your Aadhaar number um, uh, to either open a bank account or to access a mutual fund um, or uh, uh, Ola cabs could use that to authenticate their drivers. It doesn't really matter because the underlying platform remains the same. Um, interestingly, Aadhaar uh, uh, took about five years, so it was the shortest time uh, in comparison to all other internet technology platforms, be it Facebook, Google, etc., to reach a billion users. Um, during that time, what we noticed, um, the most common usage of the Aadhaar card turned out to be people actually taking a photocopy of it and sharing it um, uh, in order to do a KYC service. And KYC is typically a compliance requirement to access most financial and other such formal services. And that's when it led to the introduction of the second layer 
um, known as EKYC. And if any of you have uh, accessed a SIM card or bought a SIM card recently, uh, one of the major telecom players used EKYC to scale up to 100 million subscribers in a similar number of days, where you could basically walk in, uh, authenticate yourself, prove your identity, in a secure manner, share your KYC details uh, uh, from UIDI with that service provider, and then walk out with an activated SIM card in, five se in about, whatever, two, three minutes flat. And every day, about 10 million odd EKYCs are performed. Similarly, because the underlying platforms remain the same, people are performing EKYCs to access health services, financial services, it doesn't really matter. After that, on top of other e EKYC, we went ahead and built something called eSign. Uh, again, it becomes very expensive. One of the building blocks of any formal service is you have to sign or agree to a legal contract. And so the question was, given that uh, um, most Indians live in hinterlands and in very dispersed areas, it becomes very expensive to say, send a person who's going to go and collect paperwork from their house. Uh, that really raises the transaction costs to exponential levels. And so the question was, a billion Indians have access to a mobile phone, which is about 300 million smartphones, and then the remaining feature phones, uh, can we allow them to digitally sign on their phone itself? Um, and so eSign, which is recognized under the IT Act, uh, uh, allows any Indian to legally sign any sort of contract um, against their Aadhaar identity. Um, and it's completely non-reputable. So it's based on a bunch of cryptographic primitives, which prevents things like forgery of a document and stuff like that. Later than that, about, about two years back, uh, we went ahead and launched something called the Interface, um, UPI Beam. Um, today, this is the world's f fastest growing platform. This month, we clocked about 600 odd million transactions um, um, uh, and uh, at, a, at a valuation of about a trillion rupees went through it. Um, again, it's built on the same core principle of open APIs. So uh, while the government went ahead and map on top of it, uh, you have a whole range of private and public sector companies also offering different payment services on top. So you might have accessed uh, Beam UPI either through a messaging app you commonly use or the sorts of payments apps or through a lender, etc. It doesn't matter because again, what we've realized is it's very important in India, uh, just like you have physical goods, right? You have physical infrastructure which are roads and railways, it's important, especially in the digital world, that we go ahead and build out these core infrastructures uh, that allows uh, delivery of access uh, uh, to a range of services. And then with the introduction of each of these platforms, we noticed that India were becoming data rich at an exponential pace. Um, but the dynamics were slightly different. So in the West, uh, especially in most developed countries, when they became data rich, uh, they were already economically well off. And so what you noticed was the data was largely used to shape their spending patterns, and they had high amounts of discretionary income. And therefore, the largest companies in the American or the such markets are primarily advertisement-driven companies. Uh, however, strangely, those same companies which have either the first or second largest user base in India draw piddly amounts of revenue, primarily because advertisement doesn't work out here. Um, and so the question then we asked ourselves was, could the inverse happen? So can we in India? Um, uh, use this transition of them becoming data rich, them economically rich as well. And that led, in the past one to two years, our work on something called the consent architecture. Uh, this was first adopted uh, by the financial sector regulators uh, um, uh, uh, about two years back, uh, where in essence they have said with consent, so, no, so just like money doesn't leave your account without your permission, right? You have to explicitly give your permission for your account to be de deducted. Um, uh, the financial sector regulators have decided that data cannot leave your account without your permission. So through the consent mechanism, you'd actually be able to give consent to, share, to say you want to share your bank account transaction statement with the lender to gain access to a loan, or you want to share various sorts of investments with a wealth advisor or a robo-advisor. Um, again, uh, all we're doing out is laying the plumbing so that uh, a whole host of applications can be built on top. Then what we noticed as well subsequently was platforms breed platforms. And uh, the Indian government has kind of accelerated the adoption of that. Um, uh, the new drone policy that came out, which is based on daily digital uh, known as Digital Sky. Um, and very interestingly, the way it works, every drone in India uh, would electronically register itself and 
get access to a non-reputable identity. Uh, then India's come up with a very unique standard called NPNT, or no permission, no takeoff. So in essence, uh, you'd actually digitally apply for permission saying you want to fly in this area of Indian airspace at this point in time. Um, and if approved, it would feed into your drone automatically, programmatically, and only then it would take off. Uh, if it's not been approved, uh, if your drone was legally procured, it would actually not take off. And so a bunch of drone manufacturers are currently underway on the implementation of that. Similarly, the GST system, uh, through which more small uh, 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 and large ones as well file their taxation, um, again, built out completely um, as an interoperable open API layer. So when you can go to, say, the GST portal to file taxes, you could also go to um, a, a commonly used accounting software like a Tally QuickBooks, etc., and also file taxes. So that way, filing taxes becomes a part of doing business and not a separate business altogether. Um, and, and similarly, ETC, uh, which is an electronic toll product, it's a very simple um, RFID tag that plugs into any payments wallet. Uh, you may have noticed um, at, at a bunch of toll booths across India and ETC lane. Uh, um, and similarly, because again, it's been built out as an open API platform, it's not restricted to just toll booths, but you could use it for like congestion-based search pricing and stuff like that. So that kind of each of these layers of the India stack come to um, to deliver credit to Rajni. So it starts off with, she needs access to a loan. So she goes uh, 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 on her mobile phone uh, to a and authenticates herself using an other based authentication service. Share the data to establish trust and especially for the lender to understand the risk uh, of giving her access to credit. And so through the consent architecture, um, uh, uh, she goes ahead and shares the data in a safe, secure manner. She sees a bunch of loan offers. It's very important to give Rajni agency and choice. So you can't really, the old way of doing business, which was let's create a government scheme and push that down the throat of everyone, um, is not really going to work, right? You want to allow her access to a competitive marketplace of loan offers. And so she can see a bunch of loan offers, accept the best offer. Um, using e-sign, she can actually go ahead and legally sign that contract and it's valid uh, uh, in any court of law. Um, then she can go ahead and receive money instantaneously using UPS. It's completely real-time uh, 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 a payment mechanism and it's in fact overtaken the card transactions, debit and credit in India. Uh, she then can go ahead, sell her goods. She's incentivized uh, to create a digital trail because subsequently uh, that can be used to share more data which gives her access to better credit offers and so on and so forth. Uh, and then she can repay her loan again using UPI itself. And that's kind of how, in a nutshell, uh, 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 based on the India stack, we see Rajni gaining access to credit. Um, and that's kind of how we see the Cambrian explosion. So over the next two to three years, uh, we do expect um, like hundreds of new financial products to come in uh, that allow people like Rajni, because it's now, by lowering the transaction cost to serve her, it becomes viable for a range of businesses to actually participate. So why you have most of the tech companies now participating, say, in India's payments playground for the very same reasons. Um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs>